thank you for reading that very, very long chapter in the Word of God. And sometimes when we're doing our Bible reading, we get to books like Leviticus, and it, it's kind of easy to kind of read over stuff because it's not necessarily the most exciting stuff. But every chapter in the Bible is there for a reason, right. and there's a lot of important information. And we're, we're completing our biblical health series, and we're going to be talking about cleanliness in this sermon. Now, the challenging thing for me preaching this sermon was I wanted to make it interesting. You know, I don't want it to be boring. And so what we're going to do is basically at the beginning of the sermon, I'm going to kind of cover the basic personal maintenance and stuff like that and see what the Bible says. And then towards the end, honestly, we could offend a lot of people. Not really in this room probably, but the average world out there. And right. so there will be new information that you can learn here and see what the Bible says about this. But quite honestly, cleanliness is a large part of our personal health. Okay. And, you know, honestly, as, as Christians, we understand living a holy life is important. We obviously understand diet and exercise, and people always think about those things. But just your personal cleanliness, that is very important to your health. We're going to see that in the Bible. Now, the first point we have is this, personal maintenance slash hygiene. Personal maintenance slash hygiene. So in Leviticus 13, verse 1, the Bible reads, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, When a man shall have in the skin of his flesh a rising, a scab, a right spot, and it be in the skin of his flesh like the plague of leprosy, then he shall be brought unto Aaron the priest, or unto one of his sons the priest. And the priest shall look at the plague in the skin of the flesh. And when the hair of the plague is turned white, and the plague in sight be deeper than the skin of his flesh, it is a plague of leprosy, and the priest shall look on him and pronounce him unclean. And the Bible talks about personal maintenance in terms of if you have a sickness, or here it's talking about leprosy. And it gives extremely specific instructions in this chapter of what to do. Now, it's not the most exciting, but honestly, it's pretty important if you get that plague. And honestly, we, we live in a world today where we trust the medical industry, and we think they have all the answers in life, and they just kind of negate the Bible. But honestly, the Bible has the answers for these things as well. Right. It tells you exactly what to do. It gives very specific instructions. Now, in today's world, leprosy is really not too hard to treat, but honestly, there's a lot of illnesses people get, and if we would apply what the Bible says, people would do a much better job treating those illnesses and recovering from these things. Verse number four, if the bright spot be white in the skin of his flesh, and in sight be not deeper than the skin, and the hair thereof be not turned white, then the priest shall shut up him that hath the plague seven days. And so the Bible talks about shutting this person up for seven days. Basically, this is quarantining. So for seven days, he's away from everybody else. You say, why? Well, if you're sick and you're around other people, you're very likely going to spread that to other people. Right. Right. Okay? You look at any families that have lots of kids, and quite honestly, one kid gets sick and the whole family's sick. Right. That's the way it works. So right. why? Because they're around each other all the time. And so, you know, if you have a serious sickness or illness, the Bible speaks about quarantine, okay? Now, this is basic knowledge to us that, you know, it's common sense. We know that. But honestly, people didn't really believe this in the past. They didn't understand the value of this or the importance of this. And during the Dark Ages, there's a lot of people dying at young ages because they quite simply did not have quarantine laws in place where if somebody had a major sickness, you separated him from everybody else and made sure he was recovered before he's around other people to infect them. Verse number five, and the priest shall look on him the seventh day and behold, if the plague in his sight be at a stay and the plague spread on his skin, then the priest shall shut him up seven days more. So this is two weeks somebody can be shut up or apart from everybody to make sure this doesn't spread to everybody else. Now, I'm not talking about a minor sickness, like you have the sniffles, so you have to spend 14 days quarantined away from everybody. When we're talking about major illnesses, then yes, quarantine laws are very important. And you look throughout history at major illnesses that kill millions upon millions of people, and quite honestly, quarantine laws would have changed all of that. Right. All they had to do is stop the disease from spreading, but obviously, People don't want to believe what the Bible says. They just want to figure it out on their own. Yeah. And so countries don't base their beliefs on the Bible. Verse number six. And the priest shall look on him, on him again the seventh day, and behold, if the plague be somewhat dark, and the plague spread not the skin, the priest shall pronounce him clean. It is but a scab, and he shall wash his clothes and be clean. And so the Bible says here, after this time, if, if the plague is somewhat dark, and the plague spread not the skin, then all of a sudden he is clean. Okay? Now, this is not the most exciting reading, but quite honestly, this is very important stuff for our personal health. Because the Bible speaks about when we get certain sicknesses, there are signs that we ought to look for. 
And you know, people don't want to believe the Bible. They just want to go down to the doctors and get whatever pill. And it's like, you know what? Pills have side effects a lot of times. Yeah, right. Those could have permanent side effects that you don't know about. Right. Okay? The, the last time that I had a medicine that I had to take, I, I can't remember offhand why I had to, to, to go to the doctor, but I had some sort of medicine, and it caused me to have a scar here, and that scar is still there. And it's like, you know what? There are side effects from medicine. It takes place, you, you inject some drugs into your body, it has permanent side effects sometimes. Yeah. That's the right. way it is. It's, it's not like eating an apple. Okay, there are side effects a lot of times. There are dangerous drugs that you put in your body. You don't want to just rely on the doctors to fix you. Right. And so when it comes to our personal health, cleanliness is a large part of this. Okay. Now you don't have to turn there, but in Isaiah 52, verse 11, the Bible says, Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. The Bible says not to touch any unclean thing. Right. Now, there's both a physical and a spiritual application to this. Okay? We've preached before about how sin is unclean. Right, we'll touch right. on that later on. And sin is unclean, and being around people that are sinful, you're around uncleanness, and you don't want to be around people that are full of sin. Right. Okay? Now, obviously, at our jobs, we can't necessarily avoid that, but you don't want to just be hanging out with just a bunch of you know, really sinful people. And right. going down to the bars all day and things like that. No, you want to be not to touch the unclean. But there's also a physical application to that. Look, you know, you don't want to touch something that's unclean. Right. Yep. Okay? Now, I went to college at West Virginia University, and they are always voted the number one drinking school in the nation. They basically drink more alcohol than any other nation. And look, I, I, I made it a habit not really to be out at night on the weekends, but I remember the few times that I was there, you have to watch where you walk. You say, why? Because there's puke all over the ground. It's disgusting. Right. Do you want to touch that, something that's unclean? Is that going to be good for you? It's not going to be healthy on your body. It's disgusting, but it's also not even healthy on your body, right. touching right. things that are unclean. Now turn in your Bible to Song of Solomon 1. Song of Solomon 1. Verse 1. And you have to understand that when something smells really bad, you know, usually that's that's kind of God giving you a sign that, you know, this is not good for you. Yeah. Okay? When things smell really bad, like, you know, Dorian, <laughs> but when things smell really bad, you know, it's, it, it's, it's telling you something. Okay? And so when something smells, and obviously puke is disgusting. Yeah. It smells disgusting. Right. Look, you, you don't want to be like a dog returning back to his vomit. Right, right. Okay? That would be disgusting. Okay? You don't want to touch something unclean. And if you were to do that, it would be very unhealthy on your body. That is how you get sicknesses. That's how you get illnesses. Okay? Song of Solomon 1 verse 3, the Bible reads, Because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. And so she speaks about him and says, you know, the savor of thy good ointments. Okay? Basically that he smelled good. Okay? And so, you know, honestly, in my opinion, yeah, I, I think, you know, deodorant, perfumes, things like that, you know, I think those can be good things. Okay, she speaks about her husband that he actually smells good. You should want to try to smell nice for your spouse, okay? But I want you to understand something. That although I think deodorant's a good thing, and I use deodorant, it doesn't substitute for actually taking a shower. Right, yeah. Right, and scrubbing <laughs> off the filth. Yeah. Okay? Look, if you smell really bad, just putting on deodorant, look, you smell bad for a reason. The Bible, we're not, well, God's telling you something, okay? Basically, you need to take a shower. Oh, yeah. You need to scrub and get all that off of you. Okay? Now, this seems pretty basic, but within this movement, there are a lot of single guys that are single for a reason. And it's like, they want to say, how do I impress ladies? How do I get them to like me? Honestly, a lot of times, the secret is to take a shower. <laughs> and I, I'm not exaggerating about that. It's like, honestly, it's like, just take a shower. Okay? I, I literally, and honestly, I have not seen this as a problem in our church, but, but I'll be honest, I, I've met people that are soul winners, you know, they love the Lord and stuff, but you can smell them from five feet away. <laughs> and it's like, look, you know, it's not supposed to be like that. You know, you should be taking a shower on a daily basis. You know, if you're sweating a lot, take a shower on a daily basis. Right, okay? right. Now look, you know, honestly, this, this seems really basic to me because growing up, I was taught to just take a shower. 
You know, you get soap and you, you scrub and you get off the filth. It's pretty basic. And guess what? You know what? It's good for you because if you smell bad, it's telling you something, okay? That you need to take a shower. Personal maintenance is important. Brushing your teeth, taking a shower, scrubbing, things like this. Yeah, you know, we ought to take care of our bodies, okay? Now, there's honestly a, a kind of a movement of taking less showers today. Where basically they say it's like, it gives you dry skin. And it's not good for you. You don't want to take a shower every day because it's bad on you. Your skin will get really dry. And a lot of people, not so much probably here, but honestly in Europe, this is becoming kind of like a fact. And I don't think it ever really left Europe. But honestly, you know, it's kind of a common thing where, you know, just take a couple showers a week, like once every three or four days. And it's just like, in the Bible, I understand these aren't the most exciting chapters, but the Bible speaks about basically being unclean and needing to shower and scrub yourself and get the filth off if you happen to kill an animal. Well, I mean, especially back then, you're, a lot of men, they hunted, and that's how they got the food. Or they had a farm, they killed the animal, and guess what? You would have to take a shower then. Right. It makes sense if you're, to me, if you were to kill an animal, especially if you have blood on you, that yeah, you know what, you want to take a shower. Right. Make sure you get that off because that's not good for you. And also, if you're cooking with raw meat. And so, you know, if, if, if a mom were to cook food for a household, then guess what? She's unclean, she needs a scrub, and she's going to end up wanting to take a shower or a bath. You know, the Bible speaks about it if husband and wife are intimate together. Okay, that's a natural part of life. But they are unclean there to end up taking a shower, okay? The Bible speaks about having an issue of blood, both for men and women. So if I were to have like some sort of scratch and I was bleeding, you know, you're supposed to take a shower. You're supposed to scrub off, get off the bill. See, the Bible mentions a lot of things. It's not necessarily the most exciting thing, but there's a long list throughout the Leviticus. And so my question is this, that if the Bible speaks about taking a shower for all of these different things, then can you honestly say they were only taking a shower once every four? Because don't most moms cook meat on a regular basis? Right. I mean, most people probably aren't vegetarians. And so when you're doing these things, the Bible gives principles. It's funny because people want to mock the Bible. And it's, it's just like, you know, the Bible has the answers to all of these questions. And so this idea that, you know, well, you know, you should only shower on, you know, just rare basis because you're going to get dry skin. I think that's ridiculous. Right. Because right. when you're reading the book of Leviticus, you see that you're showering a lot, and quite honestly, if you're having body odor, that's telling you something. Right. You have that for a reason. Now look, that happens on a normal basis. Yeah. Especially depending on your job, if you work really hard and you sweat a lot, then yeah, taking a shower on a daily basis would be wise. In our world today, it's pretty easy. Now in the past, it wouldn't have been as easy at times, but there's this idea that for thousands of years, people never took showers. Well, then you obviously haven't really read the Bible. Right. They were taking showers more than once a week. They were taking baths more than once a week. Yeah. Right. They have this idea, well, you know, people just, that was something in the past people rarely did this. No, actually, if you read the Bible, if they were following what the Bible says, they would probably be the best telling people if all the other nations weren't taking showers on a regular basis. They weren't taking baths. Okay? Yeah. Now, the Bible mentions a lot of specific things because what the Bible speaks about is having good personal hygiene and good personal maintenance. And quite honestly, those things are there for a reason. If you smell bad because you sweat a lot, it's actually a good thing for you because your body is telling you, hey, you need to get clean because otherwise it could lead to being sick and unhealthy. Look, if you're unclean on a regular basis, it can end up leading to diseases and bigger sicknesses, and that's why you need to wash and be clean. Right. And yes, there's a spiritual, you need to get saved, wash and be clean. There's also the physical. And the book of Leviticus, it talks about it a lot. It spoke about the plague here in Leviticus chapter 13. It gave very specific instructions for a reason. And honestly, if people follow the Bible, taking a shower or taking a bath would not be something that was rare. It would actually be very common. Now turn to Leviticus 14. Leviticus 14. And what you have to understand when it comes to the Bible is that there are a lot of things that the Bible would have advocated long before they were common. Mm -hmm. And, you know, honestly, now it's like we know, well, this is definitely true. And, yeah, you know what, the world might have been saying, well, you don't need to shower that often. But quite honestly, the Bible says that you should. And it mentions something in Leviticus 14 
Verse 6, where it says, As for the living bird, who shall take it in the cedar wood, and the scarlet, and the hyssop, and shall dip them in the living bird, and the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. It doesn't say over water. It says over the running water. Okay, what is running water? It's like when you turn on a faucet. You know, you wash your hands, and you know, you put your hands under the faucet, and you put soap on them, you put it under running water. Okay, what you don't do is basically have like a basin where you're washing your hands all day. Mm -hmm. Because you wash them and get them clean once, and guess what? You go back to that same basin later on, that big tub of water, whatever, that's become somewhat dirty, and now you're not fully cleansing your hands. Right. You say, yeah. Brother Stucky, this is obvious. We know that. Well, it's obvious to us today, but we're going to see very soon that it was not obvious to people for a very long period of time. The Bible said running water, and quite often the world would just say water. They didn't see the importance of running water. The Bible says running water. It makes sense that if the water becomes slightly dirty, you know what? You don't want to wash your hands in that dirty water. Right, right. Yeah. It says seven times in the Bible, running water. Not just water, running water. Verse 7. And he shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times, and shall pronounce him clean, and shall let the living bird loose into the open field. And he that is to be clean, cleansed shall wash his clothes, and shave off all his hair, and wash himself in water, that he may be clean. And after that he shall come into the camp, and shall tarry abroad out of his tent seven days. So the Bible is talking about washing and being clean. And quite honestly, the best way would be a shower, even above a bath. You say, why? What's running in water? Okay? If you're dirty and you go into a bath, you're going to get cleaner, but you're still bathing in unclean water. Right, okay? yeah. A shower would be better for you. Now, I'm not saying it's a sin to take a bath. And quite honestly, this, this is what I would suggest. If you, if you, now, as a guy, I've always preferred showers. I'm assuming you know, generally guys that tend to be the way it is. I would recommend then that after you take a bath, spend like one minute underneath the shower to rinse off everything. That's what I recommend. If you really like baths and you say the best thing would be right after you get done with the bath, turn on the shower and you can be full of things. Okay? Because running water is the best way. And it makes logical sense. If something is unclean and it's in that water, look, you, to be fully clean, it needs to be running water. Okay? Verse number nine. But it shall be on the seventh day that he shall shave off all his hair, off his head and his beard and his eyebrows. Even all his hair he shall shave off and he shall wash his clothes. Also he shall wash his flesh in water and he shall be clean. And so the Bible gives specific instances where it talks about running water. I mentioned that in verse number six. That would be the best way to be clean. Okay? Now I would say that most people would agree with this, that this would make sense. But I want you to understand that there was a time period that in hospitals, 30% of moms would die during the year. Around 30% of moms. You say, why would 30% of moms die? I mean, Giving birth is not the safest thing. I mean, it is safe, but honestly, even in the Bible, you see that Rachel died when she gave birth to Benjamin. So, you know, honestly, things happen. You know, so in the Bible, there's more things of women that died during labor, and it happens today as well. You know, I know plenty of people that there's, there are dangers associated. You know, it is. And here's what you have to understand, though, that 30%, though, that's a lot. Yeah, I mean, every once in a while, a mom will die giving birth 30% of the time. And quite honestly, you know, when families used to have lots of kids, quite often moms would have a few kids and then they would die delivering a baby on the third or the fourth one and the, the family would not have a mom. And you say, why is it that 30% of moms die during childbirth? Well, it actually is exactly what I just talked about. Because what the standard practice in hospitals, at least in America and a lot of places in Europe, is that when you basically have a big basin of water and you would basically do whatever, you know, at the hospital, and you'd wash your hands in that water. And then you wash your hands in water that other people are doing as well, and it's very dirty. And then you deliver a baby. What ends up happening? You're giving, you know, infections and all kinds of problems to those women. Right. It's no wonder that 30% of them ended up dying. Because if you're dealing with blood on those boxes, you need to wash your hands under running water. And then you have this big basin of water, and you make it kind of bloody, and then you go deliver a baby. Is that going to be healthy on that mom? Now you say, well, this is basic. How do people not realize this? Well, it's basic to us today. But I'll tell you what. There's a guy by the name of Ignaz Simmelweis. And I'll just read it to you this real quickly. It says, a man by the name of Ignaz Simmelweis noted that doctors would examine the bodies of patients who died 
then without washing their hands, go straight to the next ward and examine the expected mother. So sometimes they basically deal with a dead body, and then they help deliver a baby. Now, I, I would assume every mom in this room would say, hey, I don't want you know, my doctor, my midwife, or whatever, to touch a dead body and then deliver my baby. Right. Okay, right. common yeah. sense can tell you that's, that's not going to be very healthy. If you follow what the Bible says, you would realize that as well. This was their normal practice because the presence of microscopic disease was unknown. Simplewise insisting that doctors wash their hands before each examination, and the death rate immediately dropped to 1 or 2%. Now you say, well, Brother Stucky, that, that was so long ago. That was the 19th century. The 19th century. That wasn't that long ago. Right. But, but now, doctors and medicine, they know everything, don't they? They're perfect at everything. They're always right to me, right? And they got it all figured out. Yet in the 19th century, less than 200 years ago, they're dealing with dead bodies and then they're delivering babies. Now look, if you believe the Bible, you would say, hey, you need to wash your hands under running water. The Bible speaks about that when dealing with a dead animal. You know, wash your hands under running water, you're unclean. Right? You wouldn't be able to deliver a baby then. But they did not have smart practices. You say, why? Because they did not notice microscopic disease. That's what it said. They, did not, they were not aware about microscopic disease, so they had very unsanitary practices, and around 30% of moms died during childbirth. That is a large percentage of moms dying. But what happened when he discovered this? What happened when he suggested washing your hands under running water? Well, his results were mocked and laughed at, and they said that he had no medical proof, and how dare he question medical science. Years later, they found out he was right, the Bible already said this. Now, this is the same thing that happens today. If you ever question anything in the medical world and say, well, you know, this doesn't make sense, they're going to say you're a fool. Right. You don't right. know what you're talking about. You're ignorant. We're right. We're the experts. We got the degree by our name. Just trust what we say. No, I say trust what the Bible says. Because yeah. right. it said wash your hands under running water, and they couldn't figure that out until the 19th century. But if you're reading the book of Leviticus and you're following it, then guess what? 30% of moms would not die during delivering babies. Now, turn to Leviticus 14, look at verse 33. Verse 33. Now, yes, Leviticus 13, it might not be the most exciting chapter, these chapters in Leviticus, but I'll tell you what, there have been millions upon millions of people that have died from diseases and sicknesses that they do not need to die. They would just apply what Leviticus and what the Bible says. And so another thing is this, not just our personal maintenance, but also surrounding yourself in a clean environment. Right. Okay? You want to surround yourself in as clean of an environment as possible. Okay? Leviticus 14, verse 33. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, When you become into the land of Canaan, which I give you for possession, and I put the plague of leprosy in a house of the land of your possession, and he that owneth the house shall come and tell a priest, saying, It seemeth to me there is, as it were, a plague in the house. Then the priest shall command that they empty the house before the priest go into it to see the plague, that all that is in the house be not made unclean, and afterward the priest shall go in to see the house. Now the Bible speaks about a plague in a house. Now, quite honestly, this passage, I think I'm the expert in this passage, because I actually lived at a place that had a plague in the house. And it literally, Levitic, I was reading Leviticus 14 like crazy, trying to figure out what do I need to do. And so I lived at an apartment that it had a dripping water heater from above, and it went into a room I never really opened, and I opened it one day, and it's just like this scenario, okay? Now, you know, I, I, I talked to my apartment managers, and, you know, of course they said, well, it's no big deal, we'll just clean it up. It's like, no, the Bible gives specific things you must do. Because otherwise, if you live in, in a mold-infested area, it can destroy your health. Yeah. It's not gonna be good for you, okay? Verse number 37, and he shall look on the plague, and behold, if the plague be in the walls of the house with hollow strakes, Greenish or reddish, which inside are loaded in the wall. Then the priest shall go out of the house to the door of the house and shut up the house seven days. And the priest shall come again the seventh day and shall look. And behold, if the plague be spread in the walls of the house, then the priest shall command that they take away the stones in which the plague is, and they shall cast them into an unclean place without the city. So in verse 40, what it says is, you must remove every little bit of plague that there is, and it says, take it without the city. Basically, take it way far away into an unclean place. You basically throw all the, the junk, all the garbage into one place. Take it to an unclean place. You know, today we have, you know, garbage trucks that come and things like that. But basically get it away from everybody. Because if there's a plague in those stones, it can destroy people's health. 
help. Okay? Verse number 41. And he shall cause the house to be scraped within round about. And they shall pour out the dust that they scrape off about the city into an unclean place. And so basically, even the dust they're worrying about. We've got to scrape off and get any dust out of that place. Okay? Verse 42, and they shall take other stones and put them in the place of those stones, and he shall take other mortar and shall plaster the house. And if the plague come again and break out in the house, after that he hath taken away the stones, and after he hath scraped the house, and after it is plastered, then the priest shall come and look, and behold, if the plague be spread in the house, it is a fretting leprosy in the house, it is unclean. And so the Bible says, you know, you go through all these measures to fix the problem, but if it comes back, it is what's called a fretting leprosy. This is exactly what happened at my apartment. They basically, you know, went in, changed some things, painted over, you know, the black and the green streaks on the wall and all the mold that's there. Basically made it look like there was no mold. And guess what? It was back like a day later. So basically they didn't get rid of the problem. Okay? Verse 45, and he shall break down the house, the stones of it, and the timber thereof, and all the mortar of the house, and he shall carry them forth out of the city into an unclean place. So what are you doing under an extreme situation like this? You basically destroy that building. Right. You say, why? Because if you're around mold and infestation and something extremely unsanitary and unclean for long periods of time, it can kill you. It can give you diseases. Right. Okay? That's what they should have done. Now, I demanded that I get let out, and I ended up going to a different apartment that they had because I said, hey, you need to tear down this place. That's what the Bible says. And I said, look, if I have to sue also. Because if I had stayed in that place for another six months, who knows what would have happened. Because if the Bible says it's a fretting leprosy, you don't want to be around this. Okay? Now I want you to understand something. That this is an extreme example of an unclean house. But I want you to understand something. That there is a middle ground between being perfectly clean and having a plague of leprosy, a fretting leprosy in your house. And look, when it comes to a house, you know, it should be kept clean as much as possible. Right, right. Now, this shouldn't be rocket science. It's, it's basic stuff. But look, you know what? As husbands, don't just throw your dirty clothes on the floor. It's like, you know, what are you doing? You know, it's like those clothes need to be, you don't want to just be around unclean stuff all the time. You want to try to keep it as clean as possible. Now, look, I understand you're probably not going to get some crazy disease if you throw your dirty clothes on the ground. But it would be healthier for you, which is what we're talking about in this series, if you actually put those in, in the area that the laundry goes. And you end up washing your clothes and get them clean. Right, right. You want to keep stuff clean. And look, a house naturally gets dirty over time. That's the way it works. Right. If you had a perfectly clean house and you left it for a month, it would be very dirty. And you say, well, how did this happen? It, it's just the way it, it works. Right. And look, when a house is really unclean, you start seeing things like you know, cockroaches, mice, rats, things like this. Look, they're there for a reason. It's not good to have that, okay? Right. And so, yeah, you know, it, it, it wouldn't be great if we just had, like, 20 cockroaches crawling around. We'd be like, okay, we need to start keeping these a little bit cleaner, okay? And in your personal home, when you're around that home most of your life, if you're around a really unclean environment for a long period of time, it can do damage to your health. It's not good for you, Okay? Now, I'm not saying you're going to end up getting a crazy disease, but honestly, it can affect you. And right. so as much as is possible, we ought to try to keep things clean. Right. We ought to try to keep our houses clean and sur surround ourselves in a healthy and clean environment. Now, in terms of our, our uh, personal houses, you know, and basic things like this. When you have dirty dishes, you say, what do you do? You wash them rather than letting them sit out for days. Right. And if you have dirty dishes that you let sit out for days, what happens? You end up getting mold on those dishes, on those plates. That's not good to be around them. It's not healthy. And look, when I was in college, I had roommates. And I never thought I was a neat freak, but then I roomed with, you know, a few of my friends in college. And I had this story back when I was a sophomore in college. And I had one roommate who was just a dick. You know, he just didn't clean, do anything whatsoever, and you know, really lazy. He, he, he was enrolled in college. He wasn't even going to class. You know, he dropped out for a semester and things like this. And he just never cleaned anything. So basically, he would eat whatever, just leave it out, and then just for day, days it would be there and things like that. And so my other roommate got really mad. And he says, I'm going to take a stand. If he's not going to do any cleaning, I'm not here. And I'm just thinking, oh, great. <laughs> so I end up just doing all the cleaning. 
says, I'm not okay with just having trash that smells disgusting in the house for a week. Because it's someone else's turn to take out the trash. Like, well, you know what? I guess I'm, I guess I'm going to live with this for, for a year. You know, just having to do this. And I, I, I realize, I guess I'm more of an eighth freak than, you know, all of my friends, I guess. But, you know, being around an unclean environment, it's not going to be good for you. Right. Okay? Now, let me just read to you this, these statistics here. Because I have statistics, and you can look at a lot of different statistics. I don't know exactly how they determine this, but... One of this is the 25 cleanest countries in the world, and another one is the 25 countries with the longest life expectancy. Okay, the cleanest countries and the countries that where people live the longest. Okay, now who wants to take a guess out of the 25 cleanest countries? How many of those countries are also in the top 25 longest life expectancy? Any, any guesses? Now there's there's like 250 countries in the world. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of countries. So basically, you know, you're in the top 10% of cleanest countries, okay? So how many that are in the top 10% also are in the top 10% longest life expectancy? Any guesses out of 25? 22. 22 out of the 25 cleanest countries are also 22 out of the 25 with the longest life expectancy. Some statistics. Switzerland is the cleanest country in the world, and it has the second longest life expectancy. France and Sweden are tied for the ninth longest life expectancy, and they are the second and fifth cleanest countries in the world. And so 22 out of 25 are on both lists. By the way, neither the Philippines or the U.S. made the list. <laughs> so, you know, it is what it is. This is where we live. But, but there was also a few countries that made it on one list, and they almost made it on the other. For example, Denmark is the third cleanest country, but they have the 27th longest life expectancy, so they almost make both lists. And then Cyprus is the 24th cleanest with the 28th longest life expectancy. And Portugal has, is the 26th cleanest, 21st longest life expectancy. So basically, if you're on both lists, you know, if you're a clean country, you tend to have long life expectancy. That's just a coincidence, right? I don't believe it's a coincidence. Right. Because when you're around unclean environments, it's not good for you. Honestly, the only real exception is that there were a few countries in a, a few Asian countries that have long life expectancies, but they're not in the top cleanest countries. South Korea is the 60th cleanest country and it has the 11th longest life expectancy. Singapore is the 49th cleanest country with the second longest life expectancy. I, I would chalk that up to generally I would say, you know, Asian countries eat healthier than most other countries. Although I think Philippines is kind of an exception. But most Asian countries eat very healthy. So I think that although South Korea and Singapore are cleaner than most countries, they have long life expectancies, probably because the diets are very, very good. But what you're seeing is a correlation between being clean and also having a long life expectancy. Right. And so look, being around unclean environments, it's not good for you. Right. I, now, an example in the Philippines of what, what is considered the dirtiest place is... Tondo, the Tondo dump site. Right. Okay. Now, I saw a few different statistics for life expectancy. One statistic said they live an average of 40 to 45 years. Another one said the average lifespan was 36. Look, I, I'm 34 years old. I can't imagine, you know, dying in a couple years. You know, obviously things can happen, but I'm, I'm just saying, when you're around something that's extremely unsanitary and unclean, it's not good for you. Right. right. It's not healthy on your body. And so we can't really prevent, we go soul winning in some unclean areas, okay? And I believe God's going to bless us because the number one most important thing is living a godly life. But, you know, you don't want to just always be around unclean environments. In your personal time, as much as you can, you want to be around clean environments. You know, another example of this is during the middle of the 14th century, the Black Plague hit. And the Black Plague killed 30% to 60% of Europe's population. There's different reports, so it's kind of hard. So many people die, it's really hard. It's really hard to get statistics when the people taking the statistics end up dying. Because <laughs> 30 to 60% of people die, basically half of people die. Imagine being a family of four, husband, wife, two kids, and all of a sudden one week, mom and one of the little kids die. So now the husband has to take care of his child and provide for the family. Or, for example, you know, both parents died. Can you imagine having a little six-year-old and a little eight-year-old with both their parents dead? 
And you say, well, they can live with grandma. Well, no, because grandma just died alone. Well. That was reality back then. The Black Plague, this is actually, it said to me, this is where you start to get the practice of people saying, God bless you. Because when people were saying, God, when you started to sneeze, people would say, God bless you, because they were afraid you had the Black Plague and you would die. So basically, that's what I've heard is, is how that started. I've heard that, and I've also heard that, you know, Catholic Church taught that you're casting demons out of your body. <laughs> so people say, God bless you. But, you know, maybe it's a combination of both. I don't know. But basically, they were, they were being sincere. When they heard you sneeze, they were afraid you'd be dead in two days. So they were saying, God bless you. Like, basically, hopefully God's going to protect you. 30 to 60% of Europe's population. But what you have to understand, and I do believe that was the judgment of God that's way too big of a disaster for it not to be. I think that was because right. of the Catholic Church and the Dark Ages. But at the same time, if you've ever watched documentaries on the Black Plague, they tried their best. They said, we have no clue what to do. And after the plague had already spread, they said, well, maybe we need to start separating the plague from the rest of the people. It's like, no, you should have had the quarantine laws in place before it spread there. Right. right. But they were not following what the book of Leviticus said. And so they let it go to society. And then when they started to try to quarantine people, it was too late because they had already passed the plague on to other people. Right. Mm -hmm. It should have been stopped from entering into a country. They should have just not allowed those people to enter in because it's like, no, I mean, you're going to kill like half our population. Yep. Yeah. But that is what happened with the Black Plague, and it was just very unclean, unsanitary. Now, turn to Leviticus 10. Leviticus 10. <laughs> And so we looked at our personal maintenance and hygiene, and we looked at surrounding yourself in a clean environment. The last thing I want to talk about is medical things and other things that we put in our bodies. Okay? See, the Bible speaks quite a bit about basically being clean. It says, touch not the unclean thing. It says that you may put difference between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean. The Bible's very specific of it being clean. If it's unclean, it is not healthy for you. Now, here's what you need to understand. That in today's world, a lot of the medicines and things you're getting are not clean. Right, yeah. And it's like, according to the Bible, you should not put those in your body. Now, I'm not saying all medicines are bad. I'm not saying they haven't learned anything. But I'm saying that you personally better make sure that that pill that you're ingesting, or whatever you're doing, is clean. It's sanitary. Okay? Because if it is not, if it is unclean, it's going to be unhealthy on your body. Now, whenever you question anything in the medical community, they will mock at you. Right. They'll yeah. say you're a fool. You don't know what you're talking about. But what, what I want to talk about here is vaccinations. Mm -hmm. right. Let me ask you a question. How clean are vaccinations? Or do you even know what you're ingesting into your body? Okay, now let me say this, that I was vaccinated as a kid. My wife was uh, not vaccinated much, but you know, most of us in this room we were vaccinated as kids. Now, when I was a kid, they would vaccinate you for like seven things, right. eight things. Now they're like, "Oh, I'm so worried about little Johnny getting the flu one day. I'm so worried he might, you know, get chicken pox." And so they just vaccinate you with like 50 things. It's crazy how many things that you're putting in your body. And you have to ask yourself, before you're injecting that in, you got to make sure that what you're injecting in is actually clean. Right. It's actually healthy. Okay? All you have to do is go to Facebook and read post after post after post after post of a parent saying, I saw my child vaccinated. Five seconds later, he started to shake, and he's permanently paralyzed. That happens all the time. Right. You can see it over and over and over again on Facebook. But now what's happening is they're trying to censor all those posts. Right. Mm -hmm. right. They're trying to make the argument basically be like, oh, it's 2 plus 2 equals 4. You guys don't know what you're talking about. Now look, as someone who believes the Bible, everything I do should be based on the Bible first. Yeah, right. Right. Okay? I will trust in the Bible and make sure it lines up with the Word of God, no matter what the medical community right. says. Because I personally, and this is up to you to do what you want to do with your kids, I will never vaccinate you. Man, amen. And the number one reason why is because <coughs> I do not believe it lines up with what the Bible says. Okay. Now, vaccinations are not uh, uh, something that's been around for a super long time, but there's also no new thing under the sun, so I'm sure there have been things that are similar to vaccinations in the past. Okay. You say, what exactly is our vaccinations? Well, here's what it says about vaccinations. 
A vaccine typically contains an agent that resembles a disease-causing microorganism, microorganism and is often made from weakened or killed forms of the microbe. Its toxins are one of its surface proteins. The agent stimulates the body's immune system to recognize the agent as foreign, destroy it, and remember. So that the immune system can more easily recognize and destroy any of these microorganisms that it later encounters. So basically, you inject a disease into your body. Right. Right. But it, it, it's like a, a low dose of the disease, and it's supposed to help you fight off a big dose of the disease. Now, I don't know. To me, it never made any sense. Yeah. Like, I, I was like everybody else. Before I became a Christian, I never really thought about anything. You just kind of assume what you're taught is true or whatever. But when I got saved, I remember because you know my, my sister was not vaccinated. With me. She's a few years older. And I don't even know if I was saying when she told me this. She was just saying, you know, why she didn't do it. And I was just like, oh, it makes sense to me. It doesn't really make sense to inject a disease into your body. That just doesn't logically make sense to me. Right. So right. you're just an idiot. You're a moron. You're a simple. No, I, when you see like a hundred people make posts about how they personally saw their daughter get a vaccination and like five minutes later they end up dying. I'm sorry, but you know, eventually it's like that's too big of a coincidence. Right. 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 When it happens that often, it's not one case. It's not two cases. You know what happens? It's not just autism. It's with all kinds of diseases. Right after they get vaccinated, guess what? They often end up having problems. You say, why is that? When you're injecting 60 diseases into a little baby, what do you expect to have happen? Right. right. Yeah. I mean, they're a little child. Yep. Right. It's like, are you kidding? I mean, if you honestly believe in these things, and look, like, like I said, you're welcome to do whatever with your kids. I'm just showing what I believe the Bible teaches. Uh -huh. Right. And we're talking about uncleanness. And look, there's not much more unclean you can inject into your body than vaccinations. Right. right. It's completely unclean. What does it say in Leviticus 10, verse 9 and 10? Do not drink wine nor strong drink. Thou nor thy sons with thee. When you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die, it shall be a statue forever throughout your generations. That you may put difference between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean. There should be a difference between the unclean and the clean. Yeah. Right. And look, I, I'm not going to inject something unclean into my son. Right. And look, if you will have doctors, you will have hospitals that will really try to push you to do this. As a parent, if you have the same standards, the same beliefs as I do on this topic, you honestly have to fight to, to, to not have your kids vaccinated. Right. Right. They yeah. will try to do it. And some, some hospitals I've heard they just do it without asking because it's just basically the protocol. You need to be very careful as a parent. I mean, if you don't believe in them, you need to be very careful. Now, it's up to you to do what you want. But you guys better be very careful about what you're allowing to be injected into your young child. Right. And they'll, they'll be very tricky about it. Because when we were at the hospital, you know, we had, we had had a problem with the birth before. So we had a Zep delivered at a hospital. And we gave him very clear instructions. We told him over and over again. We're very um, repetitive. And then when the pediatrician came, She's like, oh, it's time for the vitamin K shot. And I said, well, wait a minute. And at the time, I didn't really know what the vitamin K shot was. I had research, and I was like, I, I don't know what that is that you're trying. She said, oh, it's just, it's just a vitamin. I said, well, I need to research it first. And what happens? Well, she ends up talking down to me and basically saying I was an idiot. That's the way she talked. Now, what's funny is, you know, I doubt that this lady even has kids of her own, but she's an expert on raising kids, young babies. It's like, she's a pediatrician. It's like, have you raised young kids? Because honestly, when we have problems with Zeph, you know, we ask you know, various moms that have lots of kids, and usually they have the answers. Oh, you need to do this, and then boom, who's gone like two days later. You know, why don't you ask a mom that's actually raised kids than right. someone who got a degree in college? Right. Right. You know, I'm sorry, but I'm going to trust the mom who's raised kids successfully than someone who got a degree in, in college. Right. Right. Turn to Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35. Now, this should not be strange preaching in this country. Because in 2017, there was something called the dang vaccine controversy. Right? Yep. Yep. It's when they wanted to get a vaccine for the dengue virus. And guess what? They found a lot of people started to die when they got vaccinated. Right. Yeah. Now, what's funny about this is they try to say, no, 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 nobody really died. It's just a big conspiracy. Well, why did you have to make such a big cover on it? That's right. Now, why is it that you can go to Wikipedia and it was so prominent that Wikipedia talks about it. It was obviously a big event. There's plenty of people that said, hey, you know, we got the, we got the vaccination. 
our child died the next day. Supposedly only 131 kids and three adults, but I don't know. I believe it was a lot more. Oh, uh, yeah. Right. Yes. But this was in 2017. This was not a long time ago. Don't tell me that they haven't figured out. You say, you say priest of Bible. Well, you know, I am priest of the Bible. Isaiah 35, verse 3. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. The Bible says to strengthen the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. And, you know, the, the best application is with a young child. See, when there's a young child, you know, they are basically at the mercies of the people that are doing things to them. Okay? Now, look, it is, it is your choice what you want to do with your kids. But you know what? As much as I can, I want to strengthen the weak hands of these young babies in our room and give you sound advice from the Bible. Because, look, this is why I preached on this at the very end. Because this whole sermon is about cleanliness. And 30 to 60 percent of the world's population die. And Leviticus talking about these things. And now they want to inject something completely unclean into your body. Right. But as a Christian, you know, it, it does not line up with the Word of God. Right. It is not going to be healthy. It's not going to be good. And here's the thing about this. It's proven not to work. It's right. been proven not to work in our country. Now turn to Matthew 9. Turn to Matthew 9. Now what's funny about this is they always make a big deal about how it should be mandatory vaccinations. The kids, anytime that they try to say that the parents can't decide to make the decision for their kids, there's a big problem. But right. they try to force you to do something. But basically, you know, mandatory vaccinations, kids don't have a choice. They say, you know, if you don't vaccinate your kids, then our kids could be at risk. Wait a minute. If you got vaccinated against the dengue virus, and then my son doesn't get vaccinated against it, why would you be at risk if you're vaccinated, which is supposed to protect you? Right, right, right. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're protected from it because you had the vaccination, why do you care about other people? No, you just want to control it. That's in right. fact, they're, they're, they're very manipulative about this because, like, when my wife moved to the U.S., you know, they talk about vaccinations you're supposed to take, and they said the reason for the vaccinations is because we don't want you to be able to bring over some disease. If you happen to have a disease and you don't get vaccinated for this, you can bring it over to a new society. Vaccinations are preventative. So if they already have the disease, that doesn't make any sense. Right, yeah. It's like, you know, and, and people don't read this stuff, so they don't even think about it. Vaccinations are supposed to prevent diseases, okay? Mm -hmm. So if they already have the disease, that doesn't make any sense. Right, yeah. But, you know, honestly, they just say stuff and people just kind of assume. Well, this is what I told the pediatrician when she was basically trying to force us to do this. I, I quoted Matthew 9, verse 12, where it says this. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. If you're whole, if you're healthy, if you're in good shape, you don't need a physician. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now look, if you break your leg, go to the doctor and you get surgery. Right. Look, if you break your leg, I'm not saying just drink apple cider vinegar and you're gonna be okay. <laughs> I'm not saying a little bit of honey is gonna fix that torn ACL. No, I mean you need to go to the doctor and get surgery. Right. Yeah. But if you are whole, you don't need a physician. Okay. Now let me let me just give you an explanation just from a logical standpoint why it doesn't make sense to me. Other than the fact that it just, it just doesn't logically make sense, but when I tore my ACL and I had surgery, my doctor told me I basically had three options for the surgery. You can either use a hamstring, I had a torn ACL, anterior crucial ligaments, a big injury. And he said you can either use a hamstring graft, where basically you take part of the hamstring and you put it in for the ligament of the ACL and it actually makes the ligament stronger than before because your hamstring's strong. Right. Another method he mentioned, he's, he basically didn't even really say much about it. He said it's kind of a new method and you could end up having lots of pain the rest of your life. So I kind of rejected that. The other method was a cadaver. A cadaver is a dead body part. Well, basically, you take another ligament and you put it in place of that and it's supposed to replicate that. Now, normally, I would have just said, you know, and, and even looking back, it's probably been the best choice using a hamstring graft. Okay? But the reason why I chose against it is because when I was in high school, I was injured for two years because I severely pulled my high school, pulled my hamstring. And I was afraid that if I took more of my hamstring, it would be even weaker, or if I took the other hamstring, I could have weak hamstrings. So I have a cadaver in my body. But this is what he told me is the concern with the cadaver. He said, your body is like a machine. And if you if you inject some foreign thing into your body, there's a good chance your body will completely reject it and it might not work. Now it doesn't usually happen, but he said sometimes your body will reject it 
And he said the hamstring graft is the safest way. You know, it works. Because if you use the cadaver, what could end up happening is your body could say, hey, this is not meant to be here, and it can completely reject it. Look, if you get vaccinated and a bunch of unclean stuff goes into your system, your body could just naturally just reject that altogether. What you're claiming would work. Right. It's like when people drink a lot of alcohol, oftentimes they throw up because their body rejects it because it's poison that's not meant to be there. Right. 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 And so even logically, I, I just don't get what they're right. and, and look, those are not my words or my thoughts. That is what my surgeon told me. He said that if you have, you know, a cadaver in your body, your body could end up rejecting it because it's not meant to be there. Now, let's look at one last place, Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19. Now, as I said, you know, you, you're all welcome to do what you want. You know, as parents, as fathers, as mothers, if God gave you children, it's your job to raise them. It's not my job. You know, I'll, I'll preach what the Bible says, give you guidance, and then you make the choices. You know, if you say, hey, you know, I just want my kid to watch TV all day, well, that's your choice. You know, I'm not going to go to your home and make your decision for you. I'm just giving you guidance from the Word of God. But you say, well, why are you preaching on this? It's so controversial. I'm preaching on it because it ties in with the sermon. Yes. But also, you preach on what are issues of the day. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Now, according to their claim, vaccinations are a new thing. So why is it that the world's been around for four and a half million years before that? <laughs> and now all of a sudden, just a hundred years ago, whoops, we need all these vaccinations. It's like that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Right. right. Now, Leviticus 19, verse 28, the Bible reads this. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. And so Leviticus 19, verse 28, it's referencing tattoos. Right. We're moving on from vaccinations. Mm -hmm. And basically not to put any marks upon you. Now, look, you know, many people have tattoos, and I'm sure many people in this room do, and, you know, that's fine. You know, the past is the past. But the Bible does speak against having tattoos. But what I'm talking about is the fact that tattoos aren't clean. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, that's probably not healthy on your body. And look, tattoos weren't necessarily very common until recently. You know, you could look at a, if you watch highlights of a basketball game from the 70s, you're going to see zero people with tattoos. <laughs> you watch a highlight from a basketball game today, you're going to see 100% of people with tattoos. Like every single person except for like one person. Almost everybody has tattoos. Okay? And look, it's, it's not going to be healthy for you. It's, it's not clean. You know, just injecting ink, that's, that's not where it's meant to be, okay? Now, let me just talk about one last thing before we conclude. And I didn't really talk about sin in the sermon because I already kind of covered that, but alcohol, drugs, cigarettes, these are all things that are unclean, okay? Now, let me read part, two, part of an article to you from King James, okay? King James has one of the earliest writings against tobacco. Yeah. It was called A Counterblast to Tobacco by King James. Now, this is, a, this is a long article. I don't have time to, to read the whole thing. But he, and this is kind of in, in, in older type English. But what he says is about tobacco. It's custom, loathsome to the eye, hateful to the nose, harmful to the brain, dangerous to the lungs, and in the black stinking fume thereof, nearest resembling the horrible stingian smoke of the pit that is bottomless. So basically, he says tobacco is like from the pits of hell. And that's what King James said. He says it's dangerous on the lungs. Now, it's funny because you can look at cigarette ads from 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and you can literally see people, probably more than 30 years ago, but, but 50 years ago. Like there's a, um, Rod Serling's a famous person who, wrote, who did the Twilight um, Zone series, and he died of tobacco. Like he got, he got cancer from smoking tobacco. He ended up dying from it. But if you watch that, in between those episodes, he basically, he used to do ads for smoking. And he would smoke it, and he's like, goes down smooth. And he was basically promoting it, and it was considered something, it's not unhealthy. Now look, the first time somebody smokes, they end up coughing like crazy. Yeah. Right. So how would that be healthy? It's not clean, it's unclean. But you know, honestly, King James was around 400 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that this medical world has just discovered smoking is unhealthy. It's like, no, I mean, common sense would have told me that a long time ago. Right. Right. You don't always have to wait on the medical world to figure stuff out for you. Usually we can figure this out. So when it comes to this sermon, we as much as we can, we should try to be as, as clean as possible. Right. That includes, you know, basically not, sin in and of, of itself is unclean. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you should try to be in a clean environment. You know, just basic maintenance. 
basic, you know, you do the laundry, you wash the dishes. You know, if you're a single guy that lives on your own, you should not have dirty, dirty dishes in your sink for like a week. Yeah. <coughs> but, you know, this whole series of biblical health, the world doesn't really like to look at what the Bible says about health. Mm-hmm. Quite honestly, I think we've seen the Bible talks about it a lot. And we don't always have to wait for the world because the world is wrong and lost. They don't understand the importance of godliness. They don't understand what is and isn't a healthy diet. They don't understand the concept of exercise or cleanliness this off the concept. Let's go to the word of Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be here today. We just ask you to bless this time. Help us to apply this sermon to our lives, God. And uh, as much as we can, try to be as clean as possible and, and as healthy as possible as we can, God. Obviously, we want to live 